lecture, we looked at enzyme mechanisms in terms of the stability of the enzyme substrate complex and the importance of the transition state and how the energetics are important in the formation of the product. When we go to this lecture, we are going to look at the different enzyme classes, specific catalytic mechanisms to see how, as we learnt in the previous lecture, the specific residues, amino acid residues involved in the process and how they can act in acid-base catalysis as proton donors and acceptors, how we will see the enzyme restore its structure so that it is able to bind another substrate in a subsequent reaction. We will look at catalytic actions and enzymatic reactions. To understand this, we need to know what kind of catalytic mechanisms are possible. These are acid-based catalysis, covalent catalysis, metal ion-based catalysis, some or all of these involve electrostatic interactions, and the proximity and orientation effects, which we had visited in protein ligand binding. We know that enzyme substrate binding is a subset of protein ligand binding, and the involvement of the ligand, in this case the substrate, to be recognized by the enzyme to form the enzyme substrate complex is an important event in the process of catalysis. In the enzyme classifications that we learned in the first lecture of this module, we know that they are classified according to the reactions that they catalyze. For example, we know we have oxidoreductases, transferases, hydrolases, lyases, isomerases, and ligases. We will visit each of these types looking at specific examples to see how they conduct their catalytic operation. For oxidoreductases, we will be looking at NAD plus and NAD plus, the nicotinamide group, a vitamin B3 derivative that as we can see from the hydrogen that is coming in, the receipt of a hydride ion and we learned in the previous class the importance of the pro R in the pro and the pro S for the chirality of the specific molecule. Similarly, if we look at another example where we have FAD and FNN, FMN in the riboflavin group, which is a vitamin B2 derivative, this also receives a hydride ion in an oxidoreductase example. For the transferases, we will be looking at amino transferases. Amino transferases catalyze in a reversible fashion the transamination reaction by what is called a ping pong bye bye mechanism. When we look at enzyme kinetics, we will see what we mean by this bye-bye mechanism or ping-pong mechanism in terms of enzyme substrate complex formation. There are reactions which involve two substrates. These would be called bisubstrate mechanisms and we can see how they will react with each other in the formation of an intermediate product going on to form a final product. So there may be two substrates and two products formations, which we will see later on in the kinetic mechanisms that we will explore. In this case, we have the aldehyde group of the pyridoxal 5' prime phosphate, PLP, which is the cofactor. This forms what is called a shift base linkage between the C double bond O and the NH2. And the NH2 in this case is obtained from the epsilon amino group of a specific lysine residue that is present on the amino transferase enzyme. 
we will look at a diagrammatic representation where the lysine has not been shown to be tagged along with an enzyme or a large group, but this lysine is part of the aminotransferase enzyme. Then there are several processes, several reactions involved that are also base catalyzed and we have a hydrolysis as well in the formation of our product. The overall reaction involves the transfer of an amino group from an amino acid to a keto acid. So here is our amino acid. This is going to be transferred to an alpha keto acid. So we see this is the ketone group and this is the keto acid. This is the amino group, the amino acid, and this amine group we will see is transferred now to R2 that originally had the keto acid, whereas this R1 now becomes the keto acid. So the transfer involves the amino group being shifted in a reaction that the amino transferase enzyme does that is part of the transferase class of enzymes. Trans transamination, the process, is mediated by several different amino transferase enzymes. And as we saw, it is converting the amino acid to an alpha keto acid and the alpha keto acid to an amino acid. In the step that we have here, there is an incoming amino acid that replaces the lysine residue of the enzyme to form what is called a new shift base. Then from this, from the new shift base, we have a base catalyzed tautomerization, which involves an N amine and an imine group. And following this, we will have what is called a hydrolysis. This hydrolysis of the shift base, as you can see, is releasing the keto acid that is one of the products in this reaction. So we have the substrate bound and one of the products, the keto acid, which has now this amino part has been taken up by the cofactor. And this cofactor now has to release this to the other group that was originally the alpha keto acid to have the actual transfer of the amino group. So now that we have the NH2, we now have to transfer this NH2 to the other R2 group containing alpha keto acid. And the attachment of the keto acid to the pyridoxal phosphate will now take it to the transfer of the amino acid that is going to ultimately lead to the product formation in terms following a tautomerization as was shown in the previous slide, we will now have the amine transferred to the R2 group and this will release the amino acid. So the overall reaction has been the transfer of the amino group from an amino acid to an alpha keto acid. And this is the overall reaction. And this process is extremely important in the synthesis of amino acid, which is understandably so, so considering that we have a transfer of an amine group. In the example of hydrolases, we will be looking at another very important enzyme. This is called ATP synthase. And as the name implies, it synthesizes ATP. This is a beautiful enzyme that catalyzes ATP hydrolysis and the synthesis from ADP plus PI, as long as it as as well as ATP hydrolysis. Now, this catalysis is coupled to a proton flow through a channel. We will visit this enzyme in further detail when we look at both motor proteins and membrane brown proteins to see how we, the catalytic domain and the proton channel work to bring about the overall ATP hydrolysis 
in this example of hydrolases. So when we look at this, there are several subunits associated with this. And as we know, the ATP, the currency of energy as we call it, and the usage as we see in many reactions, the hydrolysis of ATP, the energy is used for several reactions. And this proton flow is important that reduces the rotation in the ring, which we will look at when we go to motor proteins to see how this motor actually acts. And when we see how this is embedded in the protein to bring about that proton gradient. In our class four enzymes, the lyases, we are going to look at the example of isocitrate lyase that as the name implies, as we had looked at before, involves the cleavage of a bond where we can see we have broken up or we have cleaved a bond in isocitrate to produce glyoxylate and succinate. This reaction mechanism is similar to aldolase in glycolysis, even where there also a carbon-carbon bond is cleaved and an aldehyde is released. Here is the re release of the aldehyde in this case in the term of the glyoxylate ion. And we have the succinate ion, both of which are derived from the isocitrate. The importance of this enzyme is this isocitrate lyase is the target for the treatment of latent tuberculosis. So inhibitor design is important in this particular enzyme. We look at isocitrate. The first step involves the deprotonation of isocitrate that is brought about by a, an imidazole because that we have learned can act as a proton donor and a proton acceptor. So this blue sphere that we see here is part of the enzyme that we are interested in that provides the histidine base to or the histidine residue to act as a base in the deprotonation of isocitrate. So with the deprotonated form, that is this form, we have lost this proton. This is then has a transfer with another acceptance of a proton where we will see that this bond is being cleaved and we will have our aldol cleavage to give us our product where we can see this is part of the succinate part and this is part of our glyoxylate. In the fifth class of enzymes that we will be looking at, these are the isomerases that belong to this class. In this particular example, we will be looking at triose phosphate isomerase that catalyzes the interconversion of the triose phosphate isomers. As we can see, we have dihydroxyacetone phosphate and deglyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So this is where we see the variations of DHAP and GAP. The working of the enzyme is such that the carbonyl oxygen of DHAP, that is, this is our substrate bound here, the carbonyl oxygen forms a hydrogen bond with the imidazole group of histidine 95 of the enzyme. The carboxylate group of glutamic acid 165 removes the proton from the substrate that forms what is called an enediolate intermediate. This enediolate intermediate that is formed, that is visible from, so here we have an OH group, here we have another OH group, that is the diol, and the double bond that we see there is the ene. So this is our ene diolate intermediate. In this process, histidine 95 forms a strong hydrogen bond to the C2 oxygen atom and protonates it. 
Then GLU-165 donates a proton to C2. Here is the donation of the proton to C2 producing the product. So the overall reaction is, as we can see, an acid-base reaction, an acid-base catalysis example involving an isomerase. In our last class of enzymes, the ligases, we will be looking at a specific example of pantoate beta-alanine ligase. As the name implies, this is a connection between pantoate and beta-alanine. Beta-alanine is a naturally occurring beta-amino acid, which is an amino acid in which the amine group, instead of being attached to the alpha carbon, is now attached to the beta carbon. In the overall reaction, what happens is this is the, we can see the amino group attached to the beta carbon. So we have the formation of pantothenate. We have pantoate, we have ATP, forming the AMP and the PPI, the beta alanine come into the picture to form what we call R pantothenate. This pantoate beta alanine ligase is an enzyme that therefore catalyzes the overall chemical reaction where we have ATP, R pantoate and beta alanine. This being a ligase enzyme will connect pantoate and beta alanine to form the pantothenate in the process the energy from the cleavage of the ATP is used to bring about this cleavage or this ligation rather and this enzyme participates in beta alanine metabolism and pantothenate and coenzyme A biosynthesis both of which are important in several biochemical processes and we will see them or you have seen them in several biochemical cycles as well. In another protein ribonuclease A, we will be looking at specific active site residues. So this is a hydrolase enzyme, but nevertheless being a very important protein, we will just look at its mechanism of action and see how beautifully the Active site is arranged in a manner that can recognize the substrate. In this case, the name ribonuclease A indicates that our substrate is RNA and ribonuclease A is involved in the cleavage of the protein, cleavage of RNA. In the enzyme mechanisms known, the mechanism of action of ribonuclease A, there is an involvement of a base, involvement of an acid. So we have a proton donor and we have a proton acceptor. The beauty about the proton donor and the proton acceptor and ribonuclease A is both of these are histidine residues. So we have what is called a pentavalent transition state, which we learned in our previous class as to the importance of the transition state and how the enzyme will form a complex with the transition state as well. And the stability of this transition state is important. If we look at the ribonuclease A with the bound substrate, we have a specific mechanistic detail that occurs with the histidine 12 and the histidine 119 in what is called a transphosphorylation reaction followed by a hydrolysis. But the understanding that the importance of the residues comes from their recognition of the substrate to the active site which in this case involves a transition state formation, involves histidine, two histidines that act as a base and an acid. And in the second step, their roles are reversed. So if we look at a picture of RNAs A with a bound substrate, we can see how beautifully it fits into the cleft. The last example that we are going to do in this lecture will be lysozyme. Lysozyme is another very important protein that
that degrades bacterial cell walls. It occurs therefore widely as a bactericidal agent indicating that it is killing the bacteria because it degrades the bacterial cell walls. The hen egg white lysozyme, which is one of the very well studied proteins, is a 14.3 kilodalton single polypeptide chain with 129 amino acid residues and has four disulfide bonds. This hydrolyzes the glycosidic bond from the what is called the NAM and NAG conditions of the cell wall, the composition of the cell wall. So here we have the NAG, NAM, NAG, NAM system. The lysozyme cleavage occurs at this specific position, which indicates that the binding site or the active site of lysozyme should have specific recognition for this particular bond that will the beta 1,4 glycosidic linkage that will be cleaved by the enzyme. So the interactions of the enzyme indicate that lysozyme attaches to the bacterial cell wall by binding a hexasaccharide unit. That is, it binds six of these units together and it breaks the bond between this specific unit here. So this means that there is a specific recognition as we will see by two acidic residues, aspartic acid and glutamic acid. The D residue where the cleavage will start, this is this residue. So we have the C, D and the E linkages. These are the glycosidic, these are the hexasaccharide units and it breaks it between the D and the E units. So now if we look at again this picture where we know lysozyme is going to cleave at this position. So if we zoom in on this a bit, we see that we have the aspartic acid residue important here and this glutamic acid residue important that will assist the cleavage of this particular bond, the beta glycosidic bond between the NAM and NAG of the D and E hexasaccharide unit. So what happens? So glutamic acid 35 acts as a proton donor to the glycosidic bond and it cleaves the CO bond in the substrate. Aspartic 52 acts as a nucleophile that generates a glycoside enzyme intermediate. Then there is a reaction of GLU35 with water to form a hydroxyl ion, a stronger nucleophile than water, which then attacks this glycosyl enzyme intermediate that was formed to give the product of hydrolysis. So the beauty of these reactions involves the proton, involves the hydrogen bond formation and involves proton transfer as we have seen in a number of these acid-base catalyzed reactions. This importance in understanding the acid-base catalysis and what enzymes or ra rather what amino acids are going to be involved in the active site to bring about this acid-base catalysis is extremely important. If we look now at specific methodologies as to giving us how the proximity of the substrate to the enzyme and the orientation is important as we, as we saw from protein leg and binding. We will look at the concept of rate enhancement when we consider the rates of reactions in our, in our enzyme kinetics lectures. However, just to understand that we are bringing about the combination of these two moieties to provide us with this anhydride. Now, when we have these linked together to bring about a similar kind of product, then what we see, the rotation about this is possible, but nevertheless, because the groups 
are in close proximity to each other, we have a rate enhancement. However, if we bring about a further rigidity and keep the specific moieties interacting in a specific orientation, this will enhance the reaction many fold. So the example shows that when we have two resid or two moieties that are there in solution that are likely to come together, there is, as we saw, Brownian motion diffusion, which will not always result in a product formation. However, if we can bring them close together in a manner that is going to give us the proper orientation and the proximity to the protein, which may be the enzyme, then we can bring about a several fold enhancement in the rates of the reactions, which we will see, as I mentioned, the rate enhancement, what we mean by the rate enhancement in our enzyme kinetics classes. So if we look at the catalytic mechanisms in general, we looked at acid-base catalysis and we looked at the specific amino acid residues involved in an acid-base catalysis in the sense that we have the histidines, we have the histidine residues, we had the aspartic acid, we had the glutamic acid involved in this. We will look at covalent catalysis and metal ion catalysis in the next lecture and overall proximity and orientation effects that we looked at. These are the references. Thank you.